Good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday to y'all. Welcome to live Q&A number 77. Man, it's hard to believe we've already done 77 of these things. If you are watching on replay, re replay for those of you who can speak, um, <laughs> if you're watching on replay, just go ahead and scrub past this graphic that you see up here. I do this to let notifications go out and let folks know that we are going live and that we will be getting underway. So basically right now I just sit around and wait for the clock in the other room to finish its Westminster chime, letting me know that it's 12 noon. And when it is 12 noon, I reach over here and click the magic button and say, Hey, y'all. Happy Sunday to you. Hope everything is going well for you and yours. Uh, just working my tail off here. Uh, I kind of alluded to it. For those of you who follow me on Facebook, I kind of alluded to it in a post yesterday. I've got something big happening for me personally here. Yes, it does involve the shop shed. Um, but it's something big. Big. It's a major milestone that's coming Tuesday morning for me. And um, I'm kind of torn between two different videos for next Sunday. Uh, those of you who noticed, I did not post a video today. I've changed over to that new schedule where I'm going to be posting every other week just so I can get some actual work done. <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm torn. I don't know if I'm going to do a Vectric video Sunday or if I'm going to do a Shop Shed update. We'll just have to wait and see. I'm going to make both of them, and then we'll see. It's going to be a toss-up as to which one gets posted. So um, other than that, other big news that's kind of going on right now for... Those who have may have noticed if you subscribe to Vectric's YouTube channel or if you subscribe to Vectric uh, on Facebook, if you follow them, uh, you'll notice that they, I did a uh, short tips and tricks video for them. There are more coming and there are more things coming. Uh, one of the more, I can't give away what is, what all is happening, but, um, I can kind of allude to it and I can kind of tease it. So I will say that one of your most popular requests is coming. Uh, it's going to be going, it's going to be a live event. It's a pre-recorded video, but it's a live event that is going to be premiering at, let's see, that's 9 a.m. Pacific time. So that will be noon Eastern time, 5 p.m. GMT on, let's see, that is February 16th. So that will be next Tuesday. So hope to see y'all there. I'll be there in the chat. I'm not going to be live myself, but um, I'll be in the chat just kind of, you know, um, kibitzing, cheerleading, and answering any questions you may have while the live, while the, uh, live event is uh, happening. But it's one of your most popular requests from me. It's not going to be on my channel, but we will get into it further later on. It'll be over on Vectric's channel, and uh, I'll put a link to that live stream. I'm surprised I didn't do it already. I was kind of unprepared for today. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the description of this video as soon as we're done live here. So, uh, without a video this morning and without a real topic of discussion this morning, I'm kind of left with open chat and open questions and answers. So, I'm ready to uh, answer basically just about any question you may have. We'll uh, see what's going on. Uh, Dave Blackburn asks right off the top, are you going to share stuff about the shop? Um, a little bit. Um, one of the things I did get done 
in order to be in compliance with the warranty requirements for the shed itself. I had to get it painted within 30 days of it being built. So I got it painted. Um, I was going to do a separate video on that, but I think I'm just going to include that in an overall update uh, video. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm not going to do it. I mean, nobody wants to watch a video of paint drying or some guy climbing around on a ladder, you know, slinging paint on a shed. Uh, but there will be more information on that. And the big upgrade, uh, the big milestone for me anyway, that's coming. It hasn't happened yet. And I'm not going to give that away just yet. So, um, but the shop shed, it's coming along well. I am almost at work stoppage. Uh, I'm waiting on a couple of people. And uh, when that happens, I'll have uh, a big update coming. So let's see here what other questions we have. Um, boy, let's see here. Okay, Jacques Petit Victoire says, Mark, with Aspire tool pathing, periodically after profile cut throughs, the waste pieces don't disappear with repeated double clicking wrecks the image capturing. Okay, you're talking about the, uh, let me bring up, I don't have anything to show, um, but we'll go ahead and I'll make sure that I'm sharing. I am, okay. Uh, what you're talking about is after a profile cutout, and you want to double click on the waste, you want to double click on the waste and then save a preview image. Sometimes it'll give you a warning like the warning I just got right here. Deleting from the selected point would delete all material. What you'll need to do is zoom in real close and then pan over and find that piece and double click it. it, it sometimes it seems like you should be able to get to it being zoomed way out, but for some reason, you will need to zoom in a few clicks on your scroll wheel and then double click it to eliminate it. Also, if you have tabs, it will give you that same warning. You cannot get rid of the waste if you're using tabs. So what I'll do is I'll calculate a, a profile cut out without tabs, preview everything, save the preview image, then go back and calculate that profile toolpath with tabs. And that's just so I can send the customer client or just do a screen capture for a thumbnail for a video without having the waste material there so you can see the part freestanding without this waste. So that's just something that uh, that I do that uh, helps me out. Uh, the But sometimes you have to zoom way, way in to get to some of the smaller parts and pieces. So I hope that helps. Uh, let's see. Ayal Peleg says, do you use dial indicators? If so, I would love to hear your tips about smart ways to use them. Uh, as a general rule, I don't use a dial indicator, mainly because I don't do anything that requires that level of uh, precision. It's, I work mainly with wood. And I know some of um, some metal workers and machinists who switch over to wood. They still have that machinist mentality, and they want to try to get everything, you know, plus or minus one thou. And you just don't need that level of precision with wood. Wood moves long after the tree is dead and milled up. Changes in temperature, humidity. Um, will cause wood to expand and contract. So trying to go for that level of accuracy as a general rule 
is not really necessary. And if I'm cutting out parts that I'm going to be glue, gluing together, just the moisture in the glue is enough to swell up a part. For instance, if I have to put something into a pocket, just the moisture in the glue is enough to make the that uh, wood swell enough to where it won't fit in the pocket. So you have to kind of, it's a balancing act. About the only thing I've used a dial indicator for was tramming the router on my machine. And that was to first level a glass plate on the table and then tram the router itself to make sure I had as little nod and tilt as possible. But other than that, I don't really use dial indicators because I don't need them. I, I'm just not working to that level of precision. So, let's see. Scott Malak wants to know, is there any way to change the dimensions to feet and inches? No. No, there's not. Um, if you're doing something that large, you know, um, and it, it's easy for me to say, but I've been doing this for, in one form or another for over, 50 years, um, you kind of start getting used to certain measurements in inches. I mean, you know, eight feet is 96, seven feet is 84, five feet is 60, six feet is 72. I mean, you just start getting used to that. I don't even think about feet unless I'm building something big outdoors, like the shop shed. I don't even think in terms of feet. I know that the outside dimension of it uh, is 100 and, let's see, yeah, 144 inches wide on the width, you know. I, I don't even think about it. So I don't, there is no way to change the dimensions in the Vectric software that I can think of two feet and inches. Um there might be. I'll, I'll have to look into it, but I really don't think that there is. So, uh, let's see. Uh, Carl Gierke wants to know, if someone sends you a file created in Aspire 10.5, can I machine that file if I'm running vCarve Pro 10.5? Yes and no. If it's saved as a CRV file in Aspire, you should be able to run it in vCarve. If it's saved as a CRV 3D file, no, you can't. vCarve will not open a CRV 3D file. Something else to consider is if there is anything in that Aspire file that is done in Aspire that can't be done in vCarve, Aspire will remove it from the file before it gets saved as a CRV. So if somebody makes a 3D model that involves a two-rail sweep and then tries to save that as a CRV file, it will remove that two-rail sweep and therefore that model. The only way that you can that they can save a file for you is if they export a 3D model as an STL file send that to you, then you can import that STL file into vCarve. But if it's just a standard, they drew up a profile that you like and there's some vCarving, you can ask them to save it for you in CRV format. And let me go back to Aspire here and we'll switch over to the drawing tab. And go back in here. And all you'll do is click File, Save As. And then down here, Save As Type, Aspire File. You can switch it over to VCAR File. But, again, it will remove anything that is Aspire only from the file before it is saved. So, I'll cancel that come back over here make sure I'm no longer screen sharing so I hope that uh, I hope that uh, answers that question let me go back down here and see if we okay alrighty um, let's see 
Jeff Woody Wand says, I went to preview a toolpath in slow motion, but my speed slider is grayed out. Software or me? Uh, select the toolpath. If you're... Okay, it can't be running a preview. Once it's running a preview, it's too late. You need to slow it down before you select that toolpath and click on preview. But uh, you should be able to slow it down. So, let's see. Uh, Mike Mazalik uh, makes an excellent point here. Um, also, up your preview simulation quality. as And that's for um, double-clicking and deleting the waste pieces. Let me go back over here, bring up Aspire. Go back over here. And, uh, no, I'm not. There, I should be. Okay, now I'm sharing. Uh, if you come up here under Tool Pass and come down here, Preview Simulation Quality, you'll notice, oops, you'll notice I have mine set to the maximum. And what that is, is that's the resolution of this preview when you're in the preview window in your 3D view. The quality of the display here. And it's, again, toolpaths, preview simulation quality. The default is standard. I have mine set at maximum, but I'm running a pretty decent gaming computer with a good video card. So it can handle that. And um, I've got extra RAM and all this other good stuff. Uh, the default is standard. Just l up your preview quality. It, what that does is that increases the number of pixels being displayed out here so you get finer resolution. So that will also help with the double clicking to uh, get rid of the waste material. And thank you, Michael. That's, that's something I, I totally forgot about. But you're absolutely right there. So let's see. Go back here and find you guys. There you are. Um... Lewis Denton says, carving some coasters three-eighths of an inch thick has one-eighth inch relief. Will V-carve initial in the bottom of the relief? Do I start the initial carve at the surface or at zero? Uh, an eighth of an inch down. Okay, you're talking about your... Basically, you've taken three-eighths inch thick material and for lack of a better uh, description... You have um, cut a one eighth inch pocket, one eighth inch deep pocket into that coaster. Now you want to carve in that relief. You'll set your start depth at the surface of that pocket. So you take three eighths of an inch, you've machined down an eighth of an inch, that would be a quarter inch. That would be your start depth. Then you take. Um, then you can set your flat depth from there if you're going to use it. But you, you don't change your Z0. Your Z0 will stay the same. It's just you're starting at the top surface of that pocket. So, hope that answers that. Uh, let's see. Norm Peterson says, how do you save the preview? I haven't found the location. Okay, uh, that's going to take... Uh, let me bring Aspire back up here and... That's going to take just a little bit of exploration on my part here for just a second. So bear with me. Um, I want to say that is in options. And so I go to edit, then options. And image file path right here. You'll click on this and... This is where it will save your preview images. You can click on it and uh, browse and find where you want it to save that picture. Now, let me go back over here and go in. Even though I don't have anything to preview, if I click on Save Preview Image, it asks me where to save it. So I'll navigate to where I want to save that picture. For instance, this is the last one I saved 
for the video last week, or two weeks ago, rather. And um, I would just enter a name and then save it. But uh, it should ask you where to save it before you do save it. So I hope that answers that. Well, I'm spending a lot of time bouncing back and forth here. <laughs> Let's see if we have another. But that's okay. Keep the questions coming. That's quite all right. Uh, Rodney Roberts says, I have Aspire but want to test the laser add-on. They want me to download the test Aspire even though I already have it. Is it possible to just do the laser test? You, I, I don't know anything about the laser module or the laser add-on. So you might want to contact Vectrix Tech Support for that. Because I, I just, I don't know. I don't have a laser on my CNC. It's something I'd like to add, but it's not in the cards right now. So, but that's a good question for their tech support. Okay. So, um, let's see. B Danger 123 says, is there a way to stop and start a super long project? I have a project that takes 34 hours of machining. Wow. It must be a 3D project. What you can do, oh boy, let's see. There are ways of doing it, but usually what they require is running the tool to a specific point, then stopping it. See, I don't know anything about your control software. I use Mach 3. I will go ahead and pause the tool path, write down the tool location in X, Y, and Z at that point where I stopped it. And I stop it somewhere where the bit is out of the material. Then, uh, so I'll write down the work coordinates X, Y, and Z and the line number that is currently being carved in the G code. So if it's carving line number 7,320, I will write line number 7,320. That way I can go ahead and shut everything down, come back to it the next day, fire up, home, set X, Y, zero with my touch plate, and then go down to that line of G code and start from there. It depends on your control software. You may or may not be able to do that. So you might want to check it out. I'm, um, that would be a good tech support question for your control software or your machine manufacturer. So uh, let's see, Lewis Denton. Holy cow. Thank you very much for the super chat. I really, really appreciate it. Um, wow, I really do appreciate it. So let's see here. Um, Jeff Achesinski. Okay. I hope I didn't just butcher you. Having trouble creating a v boundary vector for a profile tool path. The exterior of the job is a combination of open and closed vectors. Okay. Select all of those vectors and cut a um, profile, boy, I, without seeing the vectors, without seeing a picture of it, I, I hesitate to say, generally speaking, what I do is I would copy those vectors to another layer and then, if at all possible, join them and use that as a profile cutout. But without seeing, a, I really don't know. Uh, hit me up through my uh, the Contact Us page on my website. MarkLindsayCNC.com. There's a link in the description. Shoot me a message there. I'll reply. Then you can attach a picture there. Uh, so I can kind of get a look for it to better help you. It's one of those cases of there's not really a blanket solution because it's going to depend on what you have going. So uh, let's see. For example, create three small circles in a rough triangle shape, then connect the circles with open lines then try to create a boundary path. Oh, that's very simple. Yeah, you would. Okay, let me jump over to Aspire. And we will go back over to the drawing tab. 
and I'll maximize this here and let's say you have a uh, let's go with a quarter inch diameter okay you have a quarter inch diameter circle here another one here and another one here okay close now you want to connect these here well what I would do would be I've got one layer here copy all three of these select all three copy to a new layer I want to make that new layer active okay then I'm going to turn off layer one then come along with my line get out here and connect accept and come over here and connect accept then come back up to the top I didn't exactly hit that in the right spot over there but you'll get the point and come down to the apex there select that okay close and then come along with my scissors and trim up well it's not gonna let me trim up okay it's not gonna let me trim up nope all right so yeah that's why my line doesn't meet so type in to go into node editing and I'll do a little bit of fiddling here all right there we go now I should be able to trim that yes I can trim that trim that and that wasn't a very good fit but you get the message select then just to make sure I go over to join and I see that it is a closed vector and now I can turn on both layers and I have my three dots plus my triangle that was just a rough real quickie guide on how I would do something like that and I can still select all three of those holes uh, those circles rather I am assuming they're holes and uh, I can select them and do whatever tool path I want and then I can select that there's my profile cutout so I hope that answered your question there it's generally speaking not difficult to do there's more than one way to get things done but just as kind of a brief little quickie hopefully that answers that question let's see um, uh, boy let's see Jeff says his slider is grayed out all the time. Hmm, that's that's odd. That's very odd. Okay. Uh, Antonio Armiston says hi. Trying to create an eight inch long by two inch wide board with sixty degree angles only on the long side, basically sides for a hexagon platter. Best way to do this. Hmm. Hmm let's see so oh okay I see what you're getting at um, you're wanting to do 60 degree angles cutting them downhill as such I'm going to be having a video on that I've got to finalize one little detail on it but I'm going to be doing a video on using the fluting tool path to create a ramp and that's what you'll want to do for that if you're using V carve so but there will be a video coming up in the future. That's another one that's very popular that folks uh, want to use. Okay, you're using a spire. Two rail sweep should work. Hmm. Again, I'll do a video on it. Um, so let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, Michael Mazalek said yes. Uh, modeling resolution is different than the screen resolution. Uh, the modeling resolution that you set up over in the uh, job setup has nothing to do with the display in the 3D view or the preview screen. 
they're separate things completely. So, Mark Kulig wants to know, do you have any Mach 3 usage videos? Very few, mainly because I use a different screen set than everybody else uses. And the screen set that I'm using is no longer available. The gentleman that made them, made that screen set has stopped, uh, has taken it, taken it down. It's no longer available to the public. And, uh, so I don't do a lot of Mach 3, uh, videos and I'll be honest with you. Mach 3 for me was kind of a set it and forget it type of a thing, mainly because I don't use about 99% of it. I, I just haven't, I don't have a need to use about 99% of it. I basically use it to run G code. You can get downright fancy in Mach 3 and set up various uh, tool locations and various jigs and fixtures and and offsets and I mean you can have it do everything but break dance in the middle of your living room. And I just don't use most of that. Uh, I'm a one and done kind of guy. I'm not in production so I don't have a lot of jigs and fixtures. I have a couple but not many at all. So I don't really do Mach 3 videos. There are a bunch of Mach 3 videos out there. Um, just if you're looking for something in particular your best bet is to go over to the mock support forum and I'll put a link to that down in the description of this video. Let's see mock support. I'll put a link to that down in the description of this video as soon as we're done live here and ask your question over there because those guys, there's a few people over there who are absolute wizards with that software and they've forgotten more than I've ever learned. So, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to scroll back up here because it jumped on me. Um, okay, you do have Mach 3. Uh, B Danger 123, you do have Mach 3. Yeah, just the main thing to remember is to write down that line number after you pause it. And then when you come back, you'll start from there. So, let's see. Rob Lemke says, does it matter how much bit you put in the spindle? Can you go past the line? A uh, man, a half inch down cut makes a mess if you don't put it in so the dust collection shoe catches chips. Um, the only thing as far as depth, you can push it in until it interferes with the bottom of the taper in the spindle. Um, now, something a lot of people don't know is if you look at the shank on the uh, of the bit or end mill, not all manufacturers do this, but a lot of them do. You'll see what looks like the letter K sideways. That's not actually a letter K. That's a line with an arrowhead pointing to it. That's the minimum depth of that shank that should go into the collet. Push it past that line. I don't have one here to show you, and I don't have um, a photo to show you. I did do a video on how much bit should go into the collet. And I'll put a link to that. Down in the description of this video when we're done going live here. Um, basically, you want to put as much of that shank in there as possible. But not so much that the head of the bit bottoms out against the bottom of the collet. Because there's usually a radius there. And that can cause further problems. The collet won't grip the shank. It'll try to grip that radius, and that'll lead to bit slippage, and you don't want that. That's a mess. Believe me. Don't ask me how I know that. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, NWG Lichto. Okay. I think that's right. I don't know. Would like to cut out a 40-inch circle with Vectric, limited to 24 by 24. Can you cover tiling to cut this out? I've had a lot of questions on tiling lately. I have never done it, 
when I get moved into the new shed, I will purposely create a uh, video for tiling. Um, I'm going to refer you to a video done by CNC Nuts, Peter Pasuelo, over on his YouTube channel. That is uh, a very good tutorial on tiling. It's how to create, uh, I believe the title is how to create a project longer than your CNC's capacity. Now, you're going to be going 40 inches and you have a 24 by 24. You're going to have, you're going to be tiling in Y as well in X. I don't know what the capacity of your machine is. Make sure that, you know, you're probably going to end up doing four tiles if that's the case. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, something to watch for. Um, but I would check out Peter Pasuelo's video on tiling. And as I said, once I get in the new shop, I do plan on doing a video on tiling because it is a popular request. Let's see. Uh, Peckerhead Carving 78. Why does my profile pass cut lower than my original cut? I don't quite understand. Uh, the purpose of a profile pass is usually, not always, but usually, um, usually to cut through the material. I don't quite understand. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit? <coughs> oh, boy, excuse me. Um, let's see, Ronald Rome, Reem, Mark, can you take a SolidWorks file and convert it so it can be used in Aspire software? If so, how? Thanks, Ron. Again, um, again, that's something you would have to look into with SolidWorks. I learned just enough SolidWorks to make me dangerous. If you can export that SolidWorks file, that uh, 3D model, as an STL file, you can then import that into VCarve or Aspire. But you can, I don't think SolidWorks will save it in a format that the Vectric software will uh, recognize. So you have to export the model as an STL file, then import that into the Vectric software. So let's see. Um, Joel Morris says, I have carbide and feel I don't have all the options at VCarve. You think the investment to move to Pro? Okay, I think you're asking if I think that VCarve is a good investment. Um, the short answer is yes. The long answer is, oh, hell yes. And I say that because... I've got to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm I'm not all that experienced with other softwares. I've tried. I learned a little bit of Rhino and Rhino Cam. I learned a little bit of SolidWorks, and I learned a little bit of Fusion 360. Not only is the learning curve of Vectric software the most gentle of any software I've ever attempted to learn, and I was introduced to AutoCAD and the PC uh, the same week in 1997. But the learning curve of Vectric software is the most gentle I have ever experienced. And to be blunt, I just don't have the problems I see other people having. I just don't have those problems. I get in, learn the basics, download the free trial. In the beginning, yes, it's a lot of money and it looks like it's expensive as heck. But after six months, you'll be wondering how they can afford to sell it so cheap. I mean, I'm sold. I'm a big fan. I've made no, I've made that no secret. I'm a major fan of their software. Yes, it is worth it. Big time. Just my opinion. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. It looks like I think I... Okay, John Thompson wants to know, where do I set the bit height so it won't make a cut mark when it's going from one cut to the other? Okay, let me bring that up because that is a good question. Uh, a lot of people have asked that. 
and make sure yes I am okay so let's go back here and do this we'll come over here when you first go into your toolpath tab right here under material setup you click set right down here rapid Z gaps above material now you'll notice that I have my Z1 clearance here set to one eighth of an inch that means and just look at the little diagram here when the bit lifts up out of this hole and moves over it's going to lift up one eighth of an inch above the surface of the material that's where you set it right there Z1 the plunge gap is when the Z when when the uh, X and Y move over to start a plunge move it will plunge down at the rapid rate you have set for your machine until in my case it gets to one eighth of an inch then it slows down to the plunge rate that I have set for that particular bit now the control software knows it can't stop on a dime so it'll start slowing down before it gets an eighth of an inch away from the surface of the material but what this is doing is it's letting the it's letting the it's putting in the g-code to lift up an eighth of an inch above the surface of the material before moving from one cut position to the next and then when it plunges down it can plunge at the rapid rate until it gets to there then it needs to go to the plunge rate of the that I have set for the bit okay that right there is where you set those some people call this Z1 some people call that the safe Z setting uh, because that's what some software refers to it as but this is the setting right here the home start position that's where your G code is going to tell the bit to begin from it'll go to your X0 Y0 which is where I keep it and the Z gap above the material in my case will be an inch so no matter where I have the bit positioned if I have the bit positioned out here somewhere and I hit cycle start in Mach 3 the bit is going to move to this position so it'll move in this case because I have my XY0 set here the bit will move over to here and stop one inch above the material then it'll move to the first cut it needs to make so this is where you set your safe Z or Z1 gap your Z2 plunge gap and then your home start position I believe default is 0.8 I have this set to one inch for some reason I think that was done to clear a clamp or clear a fixture or something like that and I never changed it back but again that's come over here to the toolpath tab and right here under material setup click that set button and it's right down here okay so hope that answers that question and get back over here to where y'all are and let's see um let's see here do, 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 do. I hope that answered your question um let's see some use the profile pass to finish out a pocket and yes I have gotten a different depth than the original pocket okay I see what you're getting at um now let me ask you this about that uh, does that come after a tool change he's talking about how he'll cut out a pocket then he'll do a profile to finish a, run a profile around the inside of the pocket and the cut depths appear to be a little bit different um, if that involved a tool change 
it might be the difference between how the Z zero was set for that pocket and how that it was set for the, uh, okay, no tool change, all the same run that I, wow, that's odd. I've not run into that. I have not run into that at all. Hmm. I have not run into that situation. Uh, I, I've run into the situation where I've left tool marks based on uh, if I'm if I'm cutting out a pocket, I find that a for the profile a down cut bit works best because it makes a nice clean uh, pocket profile. But if I'm cutting out the bottom of a pocket, I'll use an upcut bit to eject those chips. An upcut bit leaves a better pocket bottom surface than a downcut bit, and a downcut bit leaves a better top surface than a uh, than a uh, upcut bit. But that's just my experience. Your mileage may vary. Um, wow, I've never run into that. Uh, that's something I want to do for a another video after I get moved into the new shop is a couple of different ways of setting Z0. Um, it could be anything from material movement, uh, and, and that can take on many forms. If you have a piece of material, say it's three quarters of an inch thick or uh, 19 millimeters thick, and you're cutting out, you're pocketing two thirds of the way down, that's a lot of material to remove. And it can kind of start warping even within the, uh, even with, with while it's still in the clamps are still screwed down because that's a lot of material to move. Um, wow. I'm going to have to, again, uh, I hate to say it, but I'm going to have to put that off for another video because I do want to experiment with a couple of ways, different ways of uh, setting Z zero that may eliminate that. Uh, something that uh, another CNC person that I talked to on occasion in Australia turned me on to, and it looks real interesting, but I want to experiment with it first. So I'm not giving you bad information. So, um, so yeah, I, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm going to have to put that off until later. So, uh, Rob Schuster, I must have picked, I must have, uh, missed a, okay, there we go. Can you, uh, Martin Gard wants to know, can you convert G code written in VCARV back into a, I think you mean CRV file? No. Once you're, it's in G code, it's in G code. Uh, that's it. Um, Vectric will not read G code. It won't import it. It won't even look at it. So. Let's see. All right. I will. Um, uh, Mike Smith makes an excellent point here. Not the part about giving me a thumbs up, although I do appreciate it. If you're not subscribed to Mike Mazalik's channel, do so now. Uh, today at 5 Eastern, that will be 2 Pacific. For those of us here on the West Coast, uh, he also has a VCAR or vector tutorial coming up, and I'm trying to remember what you're doing today, Michael. I know you've been getting into 3D carving lately here. Let me scroll back in my subscription feed because I do have a notification set for it. Uh, what are you doing today? Ah, man. I don't see it. I don't see it. Oh, here it is. 3D modeling for newbies. Lesson one, creating components with Aspire. I'm going to be watching it for sure. Um, yeah, again, if you're not subscribed to Michael Masalik, do so at this time. You're doing, a, you're doing yourself a major disservice. I'll put a link to your live premiere in the description here, Michael. And... Uh, I'll put a link to it in the description of this video as 
soon as I get done, boy, that's a lot of links. And um, hope to see you there this afternoon. Uh, Michael is one of those people I keep referring to as a wizard with this software. He has forgotten more than I've ever learned. So do check it out and hope to see you this afternoon. Sounds like Mark is underwater. Bad sound. Okay. Uh, then it's time to go ahead and call this quits. I will get all of the links put in the description of this video as soon as I can. So, sorry. <laughs> I'll check you out later on. Um, I'll catch you next week. This is a bad thing, but it's been happening 